and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast of its kind on the internet. What makes this podcast so special? Well, first off, it's hosted by me, Chad Cooper, and my lifelong pal, Mr. Bo Ransdo. And in each season of this podcast, we select a theme and identify six movies all related to that theme. And on each episode of that season, we give you all kinds of history and interesting facts about how the movie in that episode got made. And then on top of that, we give you a full review of the film from start to finish to see if it is any good. And it usually is not. This season's theme is Pop Culture Club, and it's a collection of movies born out of the popularity of pop culture phenomena that were so big that somebody had to make a movie to cash in on all this nonsense. This is episode two of season 24, and we're featuring the Jerky Boys movie, a film based on the prank phone call phenomenon of the 1990s. The movie features everything that made the Jerky Boys so innovative in their approach to annoying people over the phone, absent the humor, shock, spontaneity, and unwilling participants in their hijinks. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept of a prank phone call, this was done back in the day when you could just randomly call somebody up on the phone and and you would annoy them with a bunch of silliness and unexpected nonsense. Like here, I'll I'll make a quick prank phone call. Watch this, I'm gonna gonna call my buddy Jim. Here we go. I'm gonna use the work phone so he can't trace me. Here we go. All right, I got his voicemail. Hold on. I'm gonna gonna leave a prank phone call message from my pal Jim. Uh, Hello, Jim. Uh, This is Dr. Mitchell from uh, South City Oncology. your labs came in today, and uh, they're a little concerning. Um, could you please uh, give me a call back as soon as possible? My direct extension is, is A42, Jim. Uh, it's, it's quite important. Thank you. <laughs> Jim, we're always breaking each other like that. Anyway, while I wait for Jim to call me back in tears or steaming with rage, let's uh, let's get Bo in here to tell us all about how the Jerky Boys elevated the annoying activity of phony phone calls to a comedic art form during the age of America Online, Tickle Me Elmo, and the Macarena. Oh, oh it's Jim calling. Hold on, I better take this. Hello? Hey, Jim. What's wrong, buddy? <laughs> Language! There are kids around. Well, I'm sure there's some kids around somewhere. They're not here. <laughs> <laughs> Bo, get in here, do your intro. I'm going to let Jim yell at me for a little while. I have a very important question for you listeners. Is your refrigerator running? Or do you perhaps have Prince Albert in a can? Do you have someone there by the name of a man, first name Anita? You might suspect from these questions that we are beginning another of our patented Pick 6 Movies introduction. A place where we learn, we grow, we tell some dumb jokes, and nothing is more fitting when it comes to dumb jokes than our look at this movie about two of the preeminent phone pranksters, the Jerky Boys. But before we start talking about them, let's take a stroll through the immature history of prank phone calls. When did someone get the idea to call someone and, you know, prank them? The first use of a telephone came in 1876, invented of course by Alexander Graham Bell. The first misuse of this technology came only eight years later when this charming little blurb appeared in the February 2nd, 1882 edition of The Electrical World, a trade journal for electrical workers. The article goes like this, a grave joke on undertakers. Some malicious wag at Providence, Rhode Island has been playing a grave practical joke on the undertakers there by summoning them over the telephone to bring freezers, candlesticks, and a coffin for persons alleged to be dead. In each case, the denouement was highly farcical, and the reputed corpses are now hunting in a lively manner for that telephonist. I love the idea that someone might be called a telephonist. And there are plenty of other examples in early phone history. For example, a guy named Karl Bosch, a refugee from Germany in the 1930s, decided to call a newspaper and convince the guy on the other end that he could see everything the journalist did through the phone. If the journalist waved his arm, Bosch would say he could see it, which was, in fact, true. Bosch could see the guy because the newspaper was across the street from Bosch's apartment, and he could see everything this poor sap was doing. Or how about the British physicist R.V. Jones, who called one of the chemistry students at Oxford 
and told him that there was something wrong with his phone and it could be fixed if the guy sang loudly into the phone or he lifted one leg and waved his arm over his head to fix it. People in the old days were so stupid. But stupidity is not only the realm of the physicists. Back in 1995, now deceased Queen Elizabeth II got a prank call from a DJ named Pierre Brassard during a push for Quebec independence. The Canadian caller got the Queen to say she would be happy to make a speech for Canadian unity and even coaxed her into a conversation about her special hat for Halloween. There was John Melendez, aka Stuttering John, who was a sidekick on The Howard Stern Show when he got through to our last president, Donald Trump. Apparently, Stuttering John called the White House switchboard, was initially turned away, and then called back with a fake British accent, saying he was an assistant to Senator Bob Melendez. According to the story, Stuttering John's call was accepted by none other than Jared Kushner, who overrode the skeptical White House staffers and handed the phone to then-President Trump, who talked to Stuttering John about everything from his border policies to his Supreme Court picks, and at the end of the conversation, Stuttering John left the easily fooled president with the formal sign-off and Baba Booey to you, sir. One of the most famous prank calls involves a comedian named Bob Schreiner posing as a Wendy's executive. He calls a local chain to inform them the company has received lots of complaints lately about undercooked food coming out of the location, and with just enough credibility, Schreiner almost has the guy reaching into the fryer to check the temperature and insists on the hapless Wendy's employee putting the phone in the very same fryer so he can hear the oil. But the whole reason we're talking about prank phone calls is because this episode takes a look at a movie inspired by the grand masters of telephone tomfoolery, the Jerky Boys. You have to remember this was the 90s. The internet was still new, and there were no such things as smartphones. There were barely things as smart people. So when your phone rang, most of the time you picked it up to answer it, especially if you were a business owner, the favorite prey of the jerky boys. The duo, John Brennan and Kamal Ahmed, were responsible for some of the most heard, most popular, best-selling phone pranks of all time. For a small window of this eternal dance we call time, the Jerky Boys were the biggest thing in comedy, which is a long way from their humble origins. Way back in the 1970s, Johnny B was already making prank calls. It was kind of his thing. He did other stunts too, like pushing mannequins off overpasses, basically anything he could do to get in a little bit of trouble. In the 1980s, he met Kamal in their Queens neighborhood, and the two of them made calls to entertain themselves. As they grew older, they took jobs and made an effort to be responsible members of society, but the boys could not stop with all the pranking. It was Kamal who first suggested they record these prank calls. Kamal was the businessman, Johnny B the goof, and as a pair, they were poised to take over the comedy world. They just didn't know it. Not yet. But all the ingredients were there. Johnny B had his stable of characters, the irascible Frank Rizzo, the nebbish Saul Rosenberg, the overtly sexual Jack Torse, and Kamal had a few of his own, like the grumpy Kissel or the Egyptian magician. With some of their best work recorded on tape, Kamal started passing these tapes around. He actually saw a future in prank calls, and when New York-based shock jock Howard Stern got his hands on them, he played them on the air, and suddenly the Jerky Boys were an honest-to-goodness sensation. When their first album released, titled simply The Jerky Boys, it debuted at the top of Billboard's Heat Seeker list, ahead of Radiohead's Pablo Honey, which just so happened to be a name pulled from one of the Jerky Boys' bits. The duo had signed with Atlantic Records, and their first album scorched its way to 2 million records sold. People were quoting it, there were t-shirts being made. It was a real on top of the world kind of situation. In 1994, they released their second album, appropriately titled The Jerky Boys 2, and that not only went platinum, they were nominated for Best Comedy Album at the Grammys. They lost to George Carlin, which feels like the right call, so to speak, 
but it showed how mainstream the Jerky Boys were at this point. This was the same year the movie was released, but we'll circle back to that. Let's just say it was a commercial and critical disappointment and leave it at that. In the following years, they released three more records, but none of them did the business the first two records did. And there was rising tension between our boys. By the year 2000, the guys who had giggled together over the prank calls suddenly couldn't stand to be in the same room with one another. Worse, Johnny B's father died that same year. With Kamal gone and Johnny B dealing with grief, the Jerky Boys stopped making calls. Johnny B owned the name The Jerky Boys, though, and he released some material under the moniker, like The Jerky Boys Tapes. But like every fad, The Jerky Boys had seen their time in the sun and the world had moved on. That didn't mean they were out of this business we call show, however. Seth MacFarlane, a fan of The Jerky Boys, enlisted Johnny B to voice the character Mort on The Family Guy. Kamal decided he wanted to do more substantial work and he directed some indie movies, none of which cracked the popular consciousness. He was quoted in 2014 saying of Johnny B, he's still doing the same thing like a 51-year-old idiot. Yikes. Kamal says that as the money rolled in, he was seen as something of a liability, and that the management team told him to either be happy as a sidekick or risk being replaced. He wanted to quit, but in 1991, he'd taken a trip to Bangladesh with his father. When Kamal told his father that he was thinking of leaving the duo, his father pointed to the beggars in the streets. Quoting Kamal, he says his father told him, You see that? That's how people got to live in the world. If you quit something where you can make a couple of dollars, I'll disown you. Double yikes. In later years, though, Johnny B doesn't seem to have the same animosity Kamal has. He fully acknowledges that it was Kamal who was instrumental in getting the tapes in circulation. Without him, there was no Jerky Boys. However, in 2020, Johnny B released a new record called The Jerky Boys, a collection of new calls. While there was some mild fanfare, the record failed to make much of a splash. The world had moved on. After The Jerky Boys, prank calls became a bit of a lost art, largely because caller ID and smartphones made it almost impossible to anonymously call someone. And few people pick up the phone if you do. Also, there was Star 69. You could just call back whoever called you and pranked you in the first place. And there was Jackass, the Jerky Boys ethos made flesh. Guys willing to do anything for a laugh and on camera. But despite the rift between them and changing tastes, they still have a legacy, if an invisible one. Comedic powerhouses like director Paul Feig, Renaissance man Seth MacFarlane, Scott Aukerman from Comedy Bang Bang, and Amy Schumer all credit the Jerky Boys with shaping their comedic sensibilities. Tobey Maguire slipped a few lines from the records into his Spider-Man movies, like saying a woman beat him with a stick. Their tendrils spread far and wide, no matter how briefly they burned bright. Which brings us back to the movie. The why of why this movie got made is pretty easy. The Jerky Boys were a sensation. They sold records like no comedy team since Bob and Ray, or maybe May and Nichols. Cheech and Chong? There's an analogy in there somewhere. Anyways, they were a big hit, and some producer said, Hey, these guys are a big hit. Maybe they could make me some money, only in movies, instead of those records where they just say the silly things. Unsurprisingly, it was Joe Roth who wanted to sign them to a movie deal after listening to that first record. And my earlier reference to Chong and Cheech was foreshadowing, on account of how Roth thought that Johnny B and Kamal could give those stoners a run for their money in the cult movie department. Remember, Cheech and Chong made eight movies together, not counting those where they have cameos, and they did pretty well at the box office and had even longer legs on home video. James Melkonian, director of The Stone Age, a movie I remember the cover of but have never seen, was signed on to direct. Rich Wilkes came on to co-write after serving that same role for Melkonian in The Stone Age. He also wrote the Triple X series of movies, which were surprisingly not pornographic, but rather action vehicles for Vin Diesel and Ice Cube. 
The cast is filled with character actors like William Hickey, who was born at the age of 78 like some kind of fucked up Benjamin Button and starred in movies like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, Tales from the Dark Side the Movie, and Invitation to a Gunfight. Vincent Pastore is best known for The Sopranos, where he played Big Pussy, but he turned up as the Italian heavy in lots of shows and movies. The biggest surprise is the appearance of Alan Arkin, a comic actor who has played Inspector Clouseau in one extremely ill-conceived entry in the Pink Panther series. Uh, he also starred in Argo, Edward Scissorhands, The Rocketeer, Catch-22. I mean, this guy's a legend of film. And despite some great anchoring actors and supporting roles, the movie had to rest on the shoulders of the title characters, the Jerky Boys, who simply weren't actors. When it was released in 1995, it raked in a hair over $7 million, which also happened to be the budget of the movie. When the budget of your movie equals the amount of movie your money makes, you don't get to make another movie. The box office may have been poisoned by reviews, some of which are way funnier than the movie. One reviewer called it a bad idea executed poorly. Another said, it's a comedy where the comedians forgot to show up. Both of those lines are better than almost anything in this movie. Speaking of which, let's talk about this turkey. Let's ring up Chad and add another caller to the line. Ladies and gentlemen, rubbernecks and sizzle chests. It's 1995's The Jerky Boys. And welcome to a new episode of Pick 6 Movies. I'm one of your hosts, Bo. With me, as ever, is the crank to my yanker. <laughs> yeah. I'm, not, I'm not talking to you, jerky. That's me referencing the Jerky Boys in the Jerky Boys movie. I was a fan of the Jerky Boys. Yeah, Growing yeah. up in a time when, like, you know, for you and I, prank phone calls were a form of entertainment mm -hmm. for young boys. But these guys, I mean, they took it to a whole new level. I will admit, I owned Bo. Most of their CDs, I bought them used, but uh -huh. I owned them at one time or another. I wasn't as big a fan as George Michael on Arrested Development, but I was. <laughs> a fan <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i think if you're of an age like ours yeah when the jerky boys hit and it, you know of course this season is all about pop culture phenomenons and the jerky boys were legitimately a pop culture phenomenon it was reminiscent of like that first adam sandler record or something like that where everybody you knew had heard it everybody was quoting it we've done it a number of times on this show it which shows how it's sort of seeped into our brains i fell down the stairs and my shoes fell off and i'll bring my glasses so i'll have them you know yeah. stuff like that was legitimately funny at the time and even watching this movie there are still moments in this movie where I'm like, oh, that's why I like the Jerky Boys. I'm so happy to hear you say that because as I watched it, and again, this is not a good movie, but there were at least three or four times that I just involuntarily laughed out loud. And it wasn't that I was laughing at what was happening in the movie because it's not funny at all. <laughs> yeah. But in the back of my brain, I remembered them doing this voice and I was like, that was a very funny bit. It tickled me to hear it organically from these two idiots. Here is the thesis of my issue with this movie. I've got one at the top of my notes, too. I think they're going to be the same, but go ahead. The problem with the Jerky Boys movie... Go on. ...is that by the very nature of a prank phone call... Mm hmm It is unscripted, and it is largely <laughs> improvised. It is either Johnny B or Kamal reacting to someone on the other end of the line. They're not in on the joke absolutely and so we'll we'll get to this in a minute the movie presupposes that the superpower of the jerky boy is his, is these prank phone calls and that's mm -hmm. what gets them in and out of jams yes but the problem is that what makes a good prank call good is that one person knows what's going on and the other person doesn't. Correct. And in this movie, they are just pretending to be 
characters talking to actors. It's just them doing silly voices. There's no tension. There's no shock on the recipient's end. Yeah. Or if there is shock, it's scripted shock. It's an actor pretending to be offended or confused or horrified or whatever, as opposed to somebody legitimately saying, you know, no, that is for you. I'm an old man. Right. You know, yeah. like getting an honest human reaction to somebody saying something ridiculous on the phone and to see that done well you turn to sasha baron cohen or eric andres yes. or if you need something that's a little more family friendly the impractical jokers because that is what they do they take the exact same construct of a prank phone call but put it in the real world so in the interest of pick six movies we make your movie less worse <laughs> If you had taken this movie and you had filmed them actually calling people at random mm -hmm. and then later gone back and gotten release forms and that kind of thing, but have like jerky boy calls that you had never yeah. heard before mm -hmm. that were completely legit, that you're talking to somebody that isn't in on the joke, and then after the the fact you can let them in on the joke like oh yeah these were some guys here's a yeah. contract we're gonna use here's a hundred dollars right <laughs> but if the jerky boys movie had been like hey you're going to hear calls that are 100 percent legitimate that you've never heard before and we're weaving it into this movie it would have been a million times better which is what happened with that Eric Andre's movie. They did that. I think to some extent with Bad Grandpa. Was that the Johnny Knoxville movie? Whichever one wasn't the Robert De Niro one. There's a right, Bad that's Grandpa. What I got a, <laughs> there's a Bad Grandpa and a Dirty Grandpa. And I want to mesh those universes into Bad Dirty Grandpa. The Johnny Knoxville Bad Grandpa movie has some funniest Johnny Knoxville moments ever. That scene where he shits on the wall in that <laughs> diner. I defy anyone to watch that and not have a visceral response, whether it's laughter or disgust. That's great. When his balls fall out in that strip club and they're like three feet long, that's fantastic. But yeah, that's how it works. You do all this crazy stuff and then you just find a way to stitch together a narrative that allows you to showcase this nuttiness. The other thing that they really fail on in this movie is that they make the two protagonists incredibly unlikable people. They have no real agency or objectives. And I get that their characters, like, they're kind of, they have no life goals, but they're really a couple of jerks. <laughs> you might even call them jerkies. But that's not what you, you need in a movie like this. Like, this movie needs more Wayne's World and less bad Santa. Like, I don't need two anti-heroes in a movie of this nature. Make them goofy, lovable, wacky nut jobs and their superpowers, you call it, of using their voices to get them into and out of trouble is what you find charming and endearing. But in this movie, none of that happens. They're just sitting around with their thumb up their ass, and they're like, hey, let's call and, and harass people for no good goddamn reason. <laughs> because we want to get a night out on the town everything that they do is serving their own self-interest but in a in such a terrible way not a terrible framework if their own self-interests are in pursuit of something like there's this half-assed thing with mickey and his bar that you think is going to be a thing that really isn't we'll get into all that in just a moment. Look, look, and this is getting ahead because i have this t either towards the end here's how you fix this movie if we're talking about how to make this movie less worse you absolutely do what you just said and then you add in two more elements you take johnny b who is our main jerky boy <laughs> and you have his character say hey i want to do something with my life i've been making prank phone calls but i feel like if my mom wants me to do something like i, I want to be somebody i want to do something i just don't want to sit around making prank phone calls okay, okay. all right then Kam you have kamal's character follow the the garth path and have a love interest and he really mm. wants to hook up with you know the beautiful neighborhood girl but he's too shy you with me mm -hmm. and as we go through this story we find an opportunity for johnny b to use his superpower of silly voices and prank calls to ultimately do something noble we're grading on a curve here and then we find an opportunity for kamal to end up with his love interest yeah. so they both have something that they are in pursuit of this movie has none of that it's just the two of them like yeah fuck that guy let's go to the club can we weasel our way into getting some free shit and then it's just a series of comedic set pieces that go nowhere that mean nothing and then it just ends do we need to review this movie <laughs> i think we're done <laughs> 
<laughs> if we combined our two ideas, let me just throw this at you. This would be the perfect Jerky Boys movie. I almost wish mm-hmm. they would make this movie now. The plot structure that you described, and then through the course of the film, you have like Kamal calling up a tailor or something to get a suit. And you make that an improvised phone call and just make that part of the movie. Or you have Johnny B calling a prospective employer, trying to get a job and falling back on, oh, I'm going to prank call. And then you can have both characters pretending to be somebody else to further their ends. But the end of the movie is them realizing like, oh, actually the ability we have to either mimic voices or to be quick on our feet or whatever allows us to be ourselves and being ourselves is is what gets us ahead and you film the people getting the prank phone call Mm -hmm. you can't just have the audio of it you do like they did with eric andre's show or sasha baron cohen you just bring in temp workers to work the front counter at mike's tuxedo shop and then they call up and you do this 25 times until you get a winner and you intentionally cast people that you know have a short fuse or easily (laughs) confused right Right. you You just give them a psych profile and like whoever is gonna (laughs) blow up on the phone the quickest and that's also how you get around the caller id problem is you make it so that they're calling actual businesses yeah Yeah. we have already put together a better jerky boys movie that you could make now in 2023 and it would probably be a very entertaining potentially very sweet like you could give that movie a little bit of heart and at the end of the day be like oh man there were some funny calls in there and it's got kind of a, a good message and a good emotional hook to it and boom you're done. Like, is it going to win an Oscar? No. Would it be a totally good, funny movie? Yes. Yeah. The only problem is like, so where do you distribute that? <laughs> like, is that going to go to theaters? Like, oh, it's only going to be over on the Snipple app. And you're like, what? <laughs> huh? I'm, I'm better than yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With ads. You're like, oh, shit. All the language is trimmed <laughs> out of it. Have you tried to watch anything on a streaming service that is advertised with ads? And you're like, oh, this will be good. And then you get like eight minutes into it and then the ads come up and it's like 16 minutes of advertising for crazy shit and you're like the runtime of your 90 minute movie is six hours 12 minutes <laughs> so i had this problem because i watched poker face recently on peacock okay. and poker face which by the way terrific show love mm-hmm. it it's basically colombo with natasha leone and it's wonderful but it is on peacock and i'm not paying six bucks a month for Pika because the only thing I'm watching is Poker Face on there. So they do that with, hey, you've got to watch ads. With a TV show, it's somewhat better because it feels like a real TV show and there are actually built-in breaks in that show. Right. But if you're watching a movie where somebody's like, listen, I've got an idea. We're going to go to the commissioner and then we're going to, we'll be right back. Here's an ad for (laughs) Miracle Whip. And you're like, what the fuck? I thought we were past this as a society. (laughs) I thought we had just done away with that. Like I remember when I, I cut the cord fairly early on in the streaming world like once netflix and hulu hit i was like i'm done with cable and got rid of it right when people were like hey did you see that commercial where there's the dance and pizza slice or whatever and i'd be like no i did not see that because i haven't seen an ad in months yeah. it's the best way to live and now i feel like we are regressing as a as, as a people as a culture where we have to look at ads again. look at ads Are you out of your mind? To delay discussing this movie a little bit more. I am also confused when I, first of all, you know, I don't, I don't really watch a lot of sports. You can just stop at I am confused. I I know. (laughs) But when I talk to people that watch the Super Bowl and they're just like, I don't really watch the Super Bowl for the Super Bowl. I watch it for the commercials. And I'm like, what the fuck? What do you? Yeah. That's a crazy person. You do what? I I like to watch uh, under uh, on, on what other day of the year do you watch commercials? It's like, yeah, but it's a Super Bowl. No. One day a year, I set aside some time to have corporations (laughs) try to manipulate me intellectually or emotionally. And that's what I enjoy. That's how I, like I do it. I like seeing the dogs and the horses, you know, people chasing after bags of chips, dancing babies. You know, a couple of years ago, for 30 seconds, I just watched a QR code bounce around. You fucking moron. One of the great <laughs> pleasures of my life was when I was able to just put the Super Bowl behind me completely. Look, the ads were never my thing. I don't, I, I'm not one of those people. I think all advertise, like I grew up on Bill Hicks. So <laughs> I have an inherent distrust <laughs> of advertising advertising in general uh yeah this was the comedian who said if you're in advertising or marketing 
kill yourself. And then he died. Yeah, and then he died. Uh, probably killed by an advertiser. Yeah, the advertising and marketing of cigarettes. Yeah, Got to well, it. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> As he himself said, I don't go through two packs a day. I go through two lighters a day. Um, God bless that guy. I, I Wherever he is, I hope his corner of hell is particularly comfortable. Yeah, but not only that, when the, like hitting that moment as an adult where you start to pare down the things that you watch just because other people expect you to. And I was like, you know what I don't care for? Football. I'm just going to stop watching football. Yeah, and parades. That's another one I've, <laughs> I've checked out of. Parades, uh, football, <laughs> the Oscars. There was a time where I felt kind of obliged because I'm a movie fan to watch the Oscars. And being able to put that behind me of like, what the fuck do I care who gets a trophy? Like, I'll, <laughs> I'll look at the article the next day to see who won and I'll, and this will be my reaction. Huh. And that's it. I don't have to spend three and a half, four hours to get a, huh. I think that's my reaction to most things these days. <laughs> yeah, well. Huh. Do you hear what happened in France? They're burning the city down. Huh. huh. I'll be damned. A guy got murdered across the street from where you live. Huh. <laughs> there was a sign on the door that said, you're next. Huh. <laughs> I had a pretty good run. I think that is the curse of middle age and late middle age is when you just reach that point where you're starting to get cool with the idea of your own death. <laughs> like that is that is the process of life, right? Is that this is the stage in life where you're just starting to think like, yeah, I'm on my way out. But, you know, at least I'm not doing shit I don't want to do on my way out the door. <laughs> not watching all these fucking ads. Yeah, I'm not watching a bunch of fucking commercials. And if I am, I'm starting to think to myself like, look, I'll wait till I'm in the hospital bed to watch all these commercials because then I know I'm about to die and I'm probably going to give it up on a Miracle Whip ad. That is probably the (laughs) point where I'm going to be like, you know what? No more. I just want release. Let's get through this one. It's not going to take too terribly long because this is not a very long movie. Yeah, we're we're like 15 minutes into this show and the whole show is going to be 45. So everybody <laughs> buckle up. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we start off with a Caravan Pictures logo, by the way. You remember that one with the little guy walking down the highway with a bird on his shoulder? And then here we get Johnny B using one of his signature voices and he's like, hey, silly ass, where you think you're going, buddy? And then come on. Paul tosses in a random, come back, Shane, in his Egyptian magician voice or something. Mm -hmm. And I guess for diehard fans of the Jerky Boys who saw this in the theaters, this had to be a real, let's get ready to rumble (laughs) moment. Nudging your pal, he just said silly ass. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, it's like, this is going to be great. Yeah, and I mean, we talked about it already, but the, the fact that this is a greatest hits of the record is not what they should have done. Mm-mm. Uh But I will admit, ha- not having seen or heard the Jerky Boys in some time, yeah. hearing Frank Rizzo be like, hey, that silly ass, I'm like, you know what? I laughed a lot at those records. <laughs> and the first time, because I'd never seen this before we, we did it for the show. And for about two minutes, I was like, is this going to be okay? Yeah. And then it's not. Right. But the first thing you see is like the, this crowd of people, Johnny B and Kamal are in handcuffs and hoods black hoods with big yellow smiley faces on the front kind of the have a nice day uh smiley face yeah and they're doing this perp walk yeah and like reporters are yelling stuff like hey do you know frank rizzo do you know the loch ness monster or some shit like that was who, one. who yells that out by the way listeners does the loch ness monster figure into anything in this movie absolutely not i have no idea what that was about i'm thinking the other reporters are like dave you suck as a reporter you're an embarrassment to the for the state <laughs> and so this detective sullivan kind of shoves them through the crowd we end up in an interrogation room and the guys are boys the jerky boys still have the hoods on yes you hear this detective say you boys have caused a lot of trouble you ready to talk and before we get the hoods off we get a sample of mort yeah like their most famous voices it's it again it's greatest hits of the jerky boys because we still haven't seen their faces right and most people didn't know who, what the jerky boys look like unless you saw the trailer right and, and then when you see them you're like oh uh, huh. that's probably what they would huh. look like yeah okay huh, huh. huh. Uh, <laughs> but you get like more being like oh i got what's on my ass and there's a little bit of frank rizzo and then kamala's doing some kissel what are you talking about 
putting this in a real world, which it's not. <laughs> yeah. They have been arrested. They are hooded. They are in an interrogation room. And I'm like, this dude is telling a, a police officer that he has warts on his ass. Mm -hmm. Clearly, these two do not understand the breadth and depth of the trouble in which they find themselves. Or maybe they're just mentally incapable of understanding this perilous situation. I mean, Kamal goes like Uncle Freddy's dad or something. And you're like, wh why would you be talking about somebody being dead? Part greatest hits and part sort of set up for the movie but we don't know enough to understand that at this point but the detective is like you boys have been causing a lot of trouble and then he yanks off the hood yeah and then we see johnny b and kamal for the first time johnny b's a white guy yeah and he's got a 90s era mullet and yeah. a goatee i mean it's the 90s mm -hmm. and kamal is a heavier man he's got darker skin and he is of bangladesh and trinidad ancestry mm -hmm. it's also important to note they do a really good job of making these two look the same height but johnny b is like five four and kamal is like six foot four like there's a couple <laughs> of shots in it where they're side by side and it's straight up devito schwarzenegger from twins the same <laughs> eggs but one of them got all the bad genes <laughs> the other one and got one of the them talent. got all the talent to make prank phone calls <laughs> yeah. which is why Johnny B still has a career over on Family Guy as Mort. I don't know if, if it's because he has more talent with voices or if it's just that he's a little bit quicker. He's just a little wittier. I think he's the funnier of the two. Absolutely. I, I think that's what it comes down to is that one of them is very funny and the other is not. Yeah. And I think Johnny B is genuinely a funny guy. And, you know, as we talked about, and, we, and we'll do some highlights here, but there are some moments in this movie movie where you're like if this were like on a jerky boys record this would be a funny bit but anyway so the detective is like you guys are in a lot of trouble and they're like look this is all a big misunderstanding we didn't do nothing it's just a big misunderstanding we can explain everything it all started when we were kids playing the pranks if a cop is asking you to explain some sort of crime <laughs> that you were being interrogated for you do not need to go back to when you were eight years old leading up to whatever misunderstanding is in front of you it all started when the mantle of the earth cooled <laughs> the big bang kapow <laughs> yeah so we go back to them as kids and it's johnny b and kamal as little boys calling the mother of a character that is pulled from their records a, a, a character that they refer to as brett weir uh -huh. which again on the record very funny that get brett weir i said and brett weir was just a proxy it was just the name of a random dude that they would reference as a pivot point yeah it meant nothing he was not a real person nor was he a character that they ever i don't know like manifested with a voice <laughs> get me brett weir on says <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, yeah very funny this movie's so bad the mother you see her reaction again this is when you know things are not going to go well where you just have an actress what Hello. he's running around cursing he says this is the super from across the way your kid brett weir he's spitting and cursing and stealing my mother's drawers that's pretty good this is not funny in the movie what i find funny about this is just as a premise is that this woman this adult woman which it's so terrible in the movie that these kids are your child is <laughs> this, this other kids <laughs> sure excuse me that's not another kid it's the super from across the way that supers mother's drawers yeah and he's, he calls him a fruity little bastard and he says he's been running around with underwear on his head <laughs> and so the mother goes and grabs brett weir as a kid this little boy and just starts beating his ass uh-huh in, in the, the street. street yeah that's where john b's mom steps in they peek out the window and see him take the beating and they they find that to be a real cherry on top of their shenanigans they're giggling enjoying the fruits of their labor and and Johnny B's mom grabs him, tells him to knock it off. And the one written bit that I really like in this is where she smacks Johnny B and then says, and I don't even know who this kid is. And, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, this is my friend Kamal, mom. And she's like, 
Good. Nice to meet you. And then smacks him in the head. You used to be able to do that. Just smack your kid's friends as <laughs> right. an adult. Yeah. Oh, those were the days. <laughs> now you do that and you get that series, The Slap. She says, look, if you guys don't straighten up, you're going to be sitting on your mother's couch in 20 years. With no jobs. Cut to, yeah. <laughs> right, 20 years later. And there yeah. they are on the couch. Basically wearing the same clothes, looking like adult versions of these little Muppet baby jerky boys we just saw. <laughs> Jim Henson's jerky boy baby. Johnny B looks over at Kamal and he says, what you want to do today? Hey, I got an idea. And he picks up the phone and he makes a prank phone call and he calls what I'm guessing is like a Catholic hospital. In the background, it says Our Lady of Sorrow. I think that's supposed to be a joke. And the phone gets answered by a nurse played by Susan Bloomhart. Mm -hmm. who was Missy Dandridge in the movie Pet Cemetery? She mm -hmm. was the character that hung herself because she had stomach cancer. Mm -hmm. Good to see she's getting some work. Johnny B, he does his Saul Rosenberg slash Mort Goldman from Family Guy voice. And he's like, lady, you got to help me. I got hemorrhoids on my ass. And it goes nowhere. And this woman is clutching her pearls like, oh my, uh, hemorrhoids, what should we do? And then she just hangs up. Credit where it's due. I do find lines like, so tell me, what do you do for that? Do you just jab me in the ass with a needle? or what and that kind of stuff again on a record i would have completely laughed at well you also get again the audible response of the person on the other end no, sir no no we don't do that you know, there's Paul's just tearing the, the ass right out of me <laughs> yeah just the the tension and the uncomfortableness of it is what makes it funny here it's neutered of all of that yeah yeah yeah. again so she just hangs up and yeah, then they yeah. giggle and then his mom comes back in and smacks their heads again yeah you boys need to get a job he's like ma there's no jobs out there no construction no nothing and there's a flashback to a job that they had where they were doing mortar on a building. This construction lead yells at him. The two of them are up on some scaffolding and he's like, hey, guys, get to work. And then they get on a walkie talkie and Johnny B starts using this effeminate, I'm guessing like a homosexual voice. Mm -hmm. You want to come up here and show me your toolbox? And then the guy's like, yeah, you're fired because you're fucking around on the scaffolding doing stupid voices. It's not even a prank call. The construction lead is looking at him. They're still staring at each other <laughs> silly ass come up here and we'll get each all other wet and stuff i'm like i think you might be coming on to this man or listen we'll go to a bridge and we'll jump off i'll slam you down into the water and we'll rub squid ink all over each other or whatever he says we'll rub seaweed all over each other's asses yeah and the guy's like you're fired this is where they're so unlikable in this movie that if you wanted to do that voice the effeminate male homosexual have a situation where they're put into a pinch and and if you're going to lean into that cliche put him in a hair studio do you know what I mean? Or something like that. And do it to where maybe he's imitating another person or something. Like, you know, like there are ways that you could find clever and let's argue less offensive ways to have them use this superpower that is entertaining and funny. Or more importantly, make them the butt of the jokes that he's doing the voice, but it's maybe even about his uncomfortableness of it. This stuff doesn't age super well when you're affecting that kind of gay accent as just a point of punchline of like, isn't it funny that he might be attracted to a man um so that stuff ages like a an old apple i'm even thinking doing it just even in the context of the 90s you know of where yeah. you would have been able to do this i mean hell bronson pinchot built an entire career around this we have to throw in that between these flashbacks johnny b's mom says to the two of them all the other mothers the kids are successful i ran into friend we and she told me his son brett he's successful and bought a place on on Dittmar Boulevard. And you're like, okay, so Brett Weir is now an adult. He's still in the movie, not just getting beat in the street. And he has some level of success because that comes up here in a little bit. Then we do a flashback where Johnny B is doing a Saul Rosenberg at the drive through with a family ordering burgers. And we even get here, speaking of doing the hits, and then my shoes fell off in this scene and... They asked to speak to a manager, and instead of Kamal getting in on this, it's just Johnny B going from Saul Rosenberg to Frank Rizzo. Yeah. At this point, Kamal has done really hasn't done a voice, which is kind of what happened on the CDs as well. He was really a second tier contributor to this. Anytime that it was like, oh, here's an Egyptian magician bit. Well, I can skip over this and get to the yeah. next Frank Rizzo. <laughs> but yeah, so the mom tells him to, you know, you need to quit screwing around on the phones and go find a job. Ma, I ain't cut out for a job where I got a boss. 
You mean like every job? They take off to and decide instead of going to look for a job, they're just going to go to this bar, Mickey's, uh, to day drink. Well, sure, aka <laughs> my my Tuesdays, and they get stopped on the way by Uncle Freddy, aka William Hickey. Was he Uncle Freddy in this? Yeah, I didn't catch that, but I saw him, William Hickey. And for those who don't know William Hickey by name, he is the walking skeleton of an uncle from Christmas Vacation who has the toupee. Double assing. He's that guy. He's been in a million movies, and in every single movie, he is the old man that is in a wheelchair. And I yeah. think he was about 32 when he started playing that role. He was cast as corpse number three. <laughs> but yeah. he's telling him, like, I used to have all this power in the old days. And they're like, uh huh. All right, we're going to bounce, old man. Here's another way you make this movie better, okay? Mm -hmm. You take William Hickey, the old man who lives in the townhouse right next to Johnny B's mom and Johnny B, and have him be a huge fan of their voices and their prank calls, okay? Mm -hmm. So at the end, when his character is revealed, which is at least something in this movie, Bo, Mm -hmm. it makes sense why he's giving them air cover why he protects these two clowns it's a way to kind of undo like the trouble that they're in like it's the ace up their sleeve but if you had him like you know boys boys come over here you know i want you to do something i want you to call my nurse and yeah, they're yeah. like oh come on come on it's like i love it i love it when you do this and then yeah. they call and you and you get a prank call and he's pissing his pants they're like we'll do it again tomorrow and it endears us to our jerky boys because they're being kind to an elderly man you know what i mean they have a good rapport as opposed to what happens here bro just like you said they come out and he's like hey you boys i used to be somebody they're like yeah whatever you smell like piss fuck you old man we're gonna go drink and that's <laughs> right. what happens they just leave suck it grandpa so they take off and they go to this bar mickey's and mm-hmm. this is where the owner mickey tells them like speak of making him unlikable they're like hey can we get some uh drinks there mickey and he's like no because you owe us almost 700 dollars because uh you've been running a tab and, and he's like listen guys i just can't keep the door open anymore much less give you guys 700 dollars worth of free booze and they're like right uh, all right, so I guess we'll just go somewhere else and see if we can get free booze. We'll go out to the trash bin outside and see if there's any drops in bottles. We can marry together. <laughs> see if anybody's <laughs> left some half-empty smugglers out there for us to take some hits off of. And even here, you have an opportunity. He was like, hey, guys, I can't be giving away booze. Like, you, he, First of all, it shouldn't be a $700 bar tab. You owe me over 100 bucks. You know, I can't do it anymore. Come, Mickey, come on. You got to help us out. You know, come on. And Mickey's like, you know what? All right, guys, just one. And he gives him a beer. You know what I mean? To show, like, they're good guys. As opposed to what happens, they come in and Mickey's like, you two pieces of shit. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, like, he grabs a baseball bat and all but chases them out until Brett Weir shows up and kind of calms things down. Get the fuck out of here, you two, or I'm going to shove this baseball bat so far up your asses. Ooh, silly ass. Oh, you get some seaweed. Stop it. Yeah, they don't do any of that. So Brett Weir, adult Brett Weir shows up. And he looks like he's shopping from the David Byrne suit collection, <laughs> J.C. Penney's. Like, it's truly so oversized on him. And this guy comes in and Brett Weir's like, hey, my two buddies, the Jerky Boys, J- Johnny B and Kamal. This is where you really get to see how short Johnny B is. Mm-hmm. Hey, let me buy you a beer. I'm real successful. You know, I bought a house and uh, hey, I got connections. I can get into any club in town. I'm real popular. Me, Brett Weir. And then. And Kamal says, for the first time, I think he talks in this movie. He says, wait, you know uh, that guy, Tony, down at uh, the club? And he's like, and he would know you, Brett Weir? And he's like, yeah, of course he would. Well, boys, I got to run. See you later. And then Kamal's like, I know what we're going to do. What, Rob Mickey's? No, stupid. <laughs> right. Are we finally pulling the trigger on a felony? <laughs> we cut to Kamal making a phone call down to this club to talk to Tony. And he doesn't do a voice. Right, right. It's just him being like, uh, hey, yeah, uh, this is Kamal. Can I talk to Tony? And they're like, what? No. Go fuck yourself. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know someone named Brett Weir. And they're like, well, double fuck you, click. Yeah. Yeah. And then Johnny B's like, hey, look, get out of the way. You got a strong on these guys. So he calls the club. It's like a gentleman's club. It's not like a nightclub. Yeah, yeah. And he calls down. And just goes full Frank Rizzo, which I never realized that the character voice for Frank Rizzo appears to just be Johnny B with more bravado. 
Yeah, a little I mean, sharper, a little, yeah. yeah. Hey, I'm looking for a Brett Weir. You know that guy? Yeah. We get a nice classic, open your fucking ears, jackass. One thing I will say for this movie <laughs> is that it, it it's not afraid of the profanity, and I'm glad that they didn't try to PG-13 this movie up. You couldn't. Yeah. There's too many F-bombs that they drop. I say F-bombs because I don't want to offend sensitive ears. <laughs> Frank Russo is like, look. Listen to me, silly ass. I got a couple of guys coming in from Chicago. I need you to take care of my boys for me. Yeah. And he's like, well, I need to ask my boss about this. Yeah, you don't need to tell nobody nothing. You tell him Mario sent me, all right? Fruity ass. You tell that fruity ass, uh, we grew up together. We came up together. I met him through Mario. And he's like, uh, so he's going to know you? Yeah, he's going to know me. We used to jag each other up the ass all the time. So we then cut away from this to see that our detective from the beginning of the movie is in a very and listening to this phone call right tapping the lines and hearing about frank rizzo brett weir fruity asses and, right. and all other manner of silliness then we cut back to the phone call and johnny b is frank rizzo is like hey i want you to have a car waiting for my guys they're gonna be at the corner of such and such and whatever and tony's like well i'm gonna check with my boss and he hangs up with him and then Tony, Vincent Pastore in the movie, is like, uh, I think we got to go talk to the boss, guys. Let me throw out another option for you. Please. What if Frank Rizzo, just by a real unfortunate turn of events, was a real person? I thought that's where this movie was headed. It seems like that should be the case, but I'm thinking for the jerky boys that he's like, he's been throwing out the name Frank Rizzo, and it comes to them that they're like, dude, like, Frank Rizzo is a real person. He's like, what? Yeah, he's a mobster from Chicago. You know, you called and said you were this guy, and you were in town, and it's like, oh my god, that's how you really got pulled into this quicksand of trouble and then you could kind of play it up maybe that frank rizzo does or doesn't appear at the end but they don't ever do that frank rizzo is just this kaiser soze ghost of a character that is just a voice on a phone there are so many ways if somebody had taken two seconds to think about yeah. how this movie could have been better vincent pastore and his guys uh, tony and his goons show up at this place called the baby cakes diaper service where yeah. he goes to meet with alan arkin which boy talk about slumming it in a movie yeah alan arkin Arkin is the mob boss yeah. in our film. And at this time, Arkin was coming off of, first, his delightfully comedic appearance in So I Married an Axe Murderer, which is one of the best things in that movie. But he was also coming off of Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and The Rocketeer. So I can see how he got cast in this movie, but he's really slumming it in this thing. There's one moment, I may have noted it as I watched it, that it clearly looks like he's reading off cue cards for his lines. It's a Saturday Night Live sketch performance where he's not looking at the actor he should be talking to he's looking off to the left because he didn't bother to learn his lines i love alan arkin and it feels like he is really sleepwalking through this movie he, like mm -hmm. he's not alan arkin it up which is what he normally does like he's a great comic actor mm -hmm. Look no little further. miss sunshine if you've never seen him in anything yeah absolutely what i was gonna say or the out of towners uh, -huh. uh the original out of towners is is fantastic tony comes in to see his boss alan arkin and tony who's just a generic mob He's like, Frank Rizzo called and said we should take care of two guys in town. He said you knew Mario from way back. And Alan Arkin, he's like, Mario? Which Mario? He's like, 400 Mario. Which is a pretty good lie. What are you talking about? This 400 <laughs> Marios. This guy was real pushy. He was insulting your boss. First, he's like, you don't want to hear it, boss. He's like, you don't know what the fuck I want to know. Tell me what he said. He called your names, boss. What did he say? And he's like, he, he called you fruity ass. And dude, Alan Arkins, he looks truly baffled at this insult. <laughs> right, right. Fruity ass? What the hell is a fruity Hey, uh... <laughs> Wait a second. Is this a Frank Rizzo? There was a guy back in Chicago who did this birthday party massacre with a clown. Killed the entire Carboni family. Huh. I wonder if this is the guy. Uh, listen. Tell you what. Pick these guys up. Feel them out. See what's what. That's what they do. And yeah. we see the jerky boys hanging out on the corner. And Kamal's like, Look, I don't think they're coming. As soon as he says that, this limo pulls up beside him. And they're driven into Manhattan in this limo where they're taken to this big nightclub. They're taken to the Beacon Theater. And, and this whole montage is set to Collective Souls gel playing in the background. It's oh, about as yeah. 90s as a 90s movie can get. Dun -dun 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 -dun. Get together now. Dun -dun 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 -dun. <laughs> it's the 90s. They get to the Beacon Theater, at least on the outside of it. 
And then they go inside and it looks like they're at a, I don't know what to call it, like a florist convention or something. It's a bunch of weird columns in this tiny stage up front. It's clearly not a real theater. And they're inside this place. There's a bunch of tables set up. It looks more like a small restaurant or like a jazz club. And here we see Brett Weir and he's with some floozy who's all impressed that he's a mobster. And she keeps asking him questions like, so you wax guys, you're a real wacker. That's what you do. You whack them off. And you're like, okay. And then Tony, Alan Arkin's number two, he comes over to the Jerky Boys with a couple of his goons. He introduces himself and he says, so you're Rizzo's boys from Chicago. What do you do? You run numbers, protection. And then Kamal's like, "Uh, yeah, we protect the numbers. And I'm like, again, Kamal is not doing a character at all. He's just Kamal. And Frank Rizzo jumps in and is like, yeah, we're silly like that. We're a bunch of clowns. It's not Frank Rizzo. It's just Johnny B because Frank Rizzo is our right ghost strong arm guys just johnny b doing the frank rizzo voice which is weird right like if you're (laughs) frank rizzo here and also frank rizzo on the phone it's just yeah they they didn't think about it it's a silly I'm silly. And then Johnny B looks at Tony and he says, got something you can do for me. You see that skinny piece of shit, Brett Weir? He's really getting on my fucking nerves. Take care of him, jerky. So Tony directs his two goons to go toss Brett Weir out on his ass, which they do. And I'm like, why are the jerky boys doing this? They have no real motivation for why they want Brett Weir thrown out. Here's how you fix that. They come in, they see Brett Weir, and they're like, holy shit, he can out us. He knows who we really are. And then when they do this, they're doing it to kind of cover their own ass. Here they're just doing it because they're like, fuck him. He bought a house. He's making me look bad in front of my ma. And they dump his ass literally in a trash can. We're two for two seeing people getting tossed into trash cans, Bo. In this season. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> we can be six for six, but but it's just so they can be dicks to him. Yeah, because they're not good people. For no good reason, Tom Jones comes in and shakes the hands of the jerky boys because they're the stars of the movie. Uh-huh. And Bo, he sings a cover of Lenny Kravitz, Are You Gonna Go My Way? It's head scratching. Why would you not do It's Not Unusual, What's New Pussycat, any of these? As opposed to this half-assed cover of Are You Gonna Go My Way? Like, Uh, dude. If this movie were produced by MTV Studios, maybe, but it's just head-scratching. I think a lot of the celebrities that appeared in this went down that path of they were were just riding the popularity of the Jerky Boys, and it cannot be understated how big the Jerky Boys were. I remember walking past music stores and malls back when malls were a thing and music stores were a thing, and there were full front window displays Mm -hmm. like for the entire store about the new jerky boys album coming out and there was such a wonderful mystique about it because you didn't know what the jerky boys look like the jerky boys were sort of anonymous and hid behind those voices and those in those records that's what made it kind of great yeah but then we see them and you get the real i don't mind the reveal so much i just wish that the movie captured a little bit of what made the records good. And, you know, again, that is the problem, right? So also, I think that Johnny B has much more charisma or stage or camera presence. Like he's the Johnny Knoxville to Kamal's Preston Lacey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is the one that's really the driver of all this. And again, just because you're good in one genre of entertainment doesn't mean it's going to translate to another as evidenced by this film. So Tom Jones is up on the stage and he's uh, singing, Are You Gonna Go My Way? And then these two women come over and sit down at the table with the Jerky Boys. Kamal casually stares at the cleavage of one of the women. And then he just starts to choke unnecessarily. So Johnny B just starts punching his friend in the stomach repeatedly. Mm -hmm. All the while, Tom Jones keep singing on stage as though none of this is happening in the crowd tom jones does get an eyeful of it and then while this is going on and tony our host for these guys because he misinterprets the whole clown thing and thinks they're responsible for this massacre the birthday party massacre or whatever and he tells his flunk he's like those guys they're bloodthirsty so yeah we have this misunderstanding a threes company-esque misunderstanding and we cut over to alan arkin who has a couple of scenes like this that are really head scratching where he's just hanging out with his lady friend in lingerie it's not just his lady friend though 
This is Georgia Fox, who would later go on to appear on the TV series ER as Dr. Maggie Doyle. And then later, she was Sarah Seidel on the show CSI for multiple seasons, a show that I've never seen one episode of. I've seen a fair amount of CSI. Did you know Ted Danson was on that show for four years? Yeah, him and Elizabeth Shue? Lawrence uh, Fishburne was on this? Yeah. I'm like, where the hell was I? I mean, I, clearly I'm not going to watch this ever, but... You know, you got to earn your money somehow, and I'm not like... So. It's sort of like uh, what Anthony Hopkins does these days. Like Anthony Hopkins has made like 400 movies in the past two years because mm-hmm. he's just like, well, I've got to keep working, don't I? And just shows up in anything. So, you know, God bless. He doesn't have that Bruce Willis condition, does he? No, 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 no. I think he's one of those actors that's like, I do one thing and then I move on and I do the next thing. That's just kind of his his bag, which, well, whatever. Alan Arkin isn't interested in having sex with this very much younger woman, which I'm sure she's very thankful for. And Alan Arkin <laughs> has tried to figure out the identity of Frank Rizzo. And he's just like, Frank Rizzo, Rizzo. He said he knew Mario. Which Mario? Why is he calling me fruity ass? So, uh, I don't even know what a fruity ass is. Why is he doing this? Uh, I know. Yeah. It's the craziest thing. I gotta know this guy. So then the movie then cuts back to police headquarters where we see our main detective. And he says, to catch Frank Rizzo, we gotta think like Frank Rizzo. That name's gotta be an alias. You know what? I'm gonna rest when Frank Rizzo rests. None of this dialogue makes sense. I don't even know why they're after Frank Rizzo. He hasn't really committed a crime. It's just a name. But the movie cuts back to the mob headquarters at that Italian dinner club. Alan Arkin is there. He shows up with Tony as number two and they're putting some cash in a safe and the phone rings and it's Johnny B doing his Frank Rizzo voice. He kicks things off with a, hey, what's up there? Squeaky balls or something like that. (laughs) Squeaky balls. That was something else that Johnny B had a real knack for was putting together word combinations that in and of themselves were not profane or clearly applicable. Like they were more suggestive in nature Mm -hmm. of like even fruit ass like yeah. that's one of those things that it's you know is this a slur is it something sexual is it something he would throw weird phrases out that were funny because of their ridiculousness sizzle chest is a great example of that that is there a you meaningless go. statement <laughs> calling somebody sizzle chest or in this scene th- this is one that comes up here when he calls alan arkin and alan arkin is like do I know you, Frank Rizzo? He's like, yeah, we came up together. Alan Arkin asks him, like, well, what's your interest here in New York? What do you want to do? And he says, yeah, buddy, I got to make dough like anybody else. You know, you and me, we're good like that. We're going to run the town. And Alan Arkin is like, well, uh, did you do that birthday party deal? And he's like, yeah, you know me. I used to jack people out the window. Got a short temper. They call me rubberneck. And they call me rubberneck is one of those things of like, this is totally meaningless. But it right. comes up a couple of times. And I still find they call me rubberneck kind of funny. And I feel <laughs> like if there were ever a Jerky Boys documentary, it should be called They Call Me Rubberneck. <laughs> but they hang up on him or Rizzo hangs up on him and Alan Arkin is like I gotta tell you one of my greatest teachers was this guy named Don Federico he told me something long ago he says stay close to your enemies we need to introduce these boys to the family and we're gonna give them a test and see what these boys are really like and they layer in this public domain godfather theme <laughs> yeah yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's, it's real cheap. We cut to the Jerky Boys, and they're walking into the same Italian restaurant we've seen over and over. And Alan Arkin is there with some other high-level mobsters from the family. And Johnny B and Kamal, they're totally cool with all this. Are they just extremely confident or extremely stupid? Or both? Because it feels like them being dragged in front of the mobsters, if you had made them more sympathetic or relatable characters, going into this, they should have been scared shitless. But they were like, no, 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 just like follow my lead. I'm going to put on this persona and we'll be okay, even though, you know, deep inside they're terrified. But that's not what happens. Johnny B walks in and he's like, hey, who are these fucking assholes? Right. Yeah, <laughs> they're yeah, They're going to yeah. kill you. And yet yeah, they're brought to this sit down. It's Alan Arkin, a bunch of other like older mob guys. I would bet one dollar that one of them's Philip Baker Hall in an uncredited role. <laughs> I paused it and I looked it up. I was like, that's Philip Baker Hall. I think he just showed up to visit his old pal Alan Arkin one day. Sit in the chair. You can have some craft services. It'll be fine. You ever heard of the term fruity ass? What does that mean to you? I still can't figure it out. Phil, it's going to be me. It's going to be you. There's some guys from the crew. We're just going to put some suits on them. We'll sit around. We're going to have some lunch. They're going to bring us sandwiches. Have a seat. It's going to be fine. Hey, let me ask you a question. Did you take a look at that uh, that script I sent you? The sequel to Glengarry 
Glenn Ross, uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross from Friends. It's, it's got a, a, a contemporary angle to it. I think you might like it. I'm going to call this one Glenn Gary, Glenn <laughs> Phil. You know, we just swap out the Ross. We can make 50 of these. Glenn Gary, Glenn Mark, Glenn Gary, Glenn Allen, any of these. What do you say? Also, Jack is up for it. I talked to him the other day. Lemon is good. He wants to do all of them. Guy never said no to a pot in his life. Glenn Gary, Glenn Gary Busey. That, that was an option that was pitched out as well. The man was nominated for an Oscar. I know he hit his head, but... I told him to do the grumpy old men thing. He owes me for that. He said, hey, I don't know if I want to work with Mathau again. I said, look, you get on the set with that bulldog-looking son of a bitch, and you act the shit out of that part. And he did. Also, I think he fucked Anne Margaret on the set. I really didn't give the opportunity of turning it into a country music uh, western interpretation, but I- I'm not opposed to Glenn Gary, Glenn Campbell. What do you think? <laughs> You know, I was going to be in City Slickers. I was going to play the part of the Jack Palance character, but they said I wasn't right. And I gave him the line. I, I said, look, I crap bigger than you. Does that not sound threatening? Am I not a threatening person? How about this? We make a sequel. We set it in space. We call it Gl- Glenn Gary John Glenn. Huh? Look, you put me in a mask. I'm in a suit. You put me outside the ship. I'm floating around. Oh, look, I got the leads out here in space. It writes itself. <laughs> The first place gets uh, these car keys. Second place gets shot out of the fucking airlock. What do you say? I mean, do you see that movie Moonraker? It'll be like that. Except, you know, sales. I think we'll do anything to not talk about this movie. Yeah. We're really close to the end. Shocking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, so Alan Arkin throws him a diaper with cash in it. They open it up. And what like, is this, jerky? It's a little money. What do I got to do to keep this cash, sizzle nuts? Look, it's just a little gift for you. But I'll tell you what, you could do us a favor. Go lead on a guy to sell his business. We're trying to buy up a lot of property in the neighborhood. Let me ask you this. If I ask you to go lean on this guy and get him to, to sign over his building to us, how would you do it oh my god and johnny b is like eh, well first we'd uh tie him to a tree we get uh one of them fucking tennis ball machines then we fill it with boiled potatoes and we'd shoot him up his ass <laughs> until he's blue and alan argue's like that's the sickest thing i ever heard i love it and on one of their phone calls it's entertaining because it's so <laughs> over the top and stupid yeah and you hear the person on the call responding to something like that. What are you talking about? Here, Alan Arkin is like, hmm, really? That's pretty sick, but okay. It doesn't translate as well. But anyway, so they give him a hit and they say, essentially, there's this guy who won't sell his bar. We need you to go strong arm him to get it. Turns out it's Mickey's bar. So the jerky boys head over to Mickey's bar. So outside, they're like, hey, we're going to get Frank Rizzo to handle this. And we see that Brett Weir is listening in. He is uh, overhearing this conversation. He's hiding behind a big newspaper that he's holding up. Sure. Fat Tony leads Brett Weir into like Alan Arkin and his guys. And Brett Weir tells him, hey, those guys aren't from Chicago. It's all a big phone prank. They've been doing this for years, making prank phone calls. And Alan Arkin is like, is this for real? Is this guy for real? Tony, go take care of this shit. Which Tony should take a gun and go put (laughs) two bullets in each of their heads. And then the movie's over. Yeah. That's how this would really play out. Right. But instead, we follow the Jerky Boys into Mickey's, and they pay him for the bar tab out of the money that they got from Alan Arkin. He's like, you boys are swell. Thanks for the money. Well, and then he tells them, hey, I gotta warn you, though, the mob sent us over here to rough you up. And then Mickey goes John Wick on and just grabs like a pull cue and starts beating the shit out of these two guys. This old man, he just starts beating the holy hell out of both of them. He's like, get the fuck out of my bar, you pieces of shit. And they're like, no, no, we're not actually going to do it. We're just letting you know that they sent us over to do it. And maybe the biggest laugh of the movie I have is right here where Johnny B says, look, Mickey, we're not going to let this place get torn down. And (laughs) Mickey goes, why? And I was like, yeah, that's a great question. Why do they give a shit? He does say, this is where I had my first beer. So your sentimentality? Yeah, right. Get over that. Exactly. And like I said, th- this feels like something that ought to be a big deal in the movie, but it's not. This is really the last time we're worried about Mickey's and his bar. Um, no. On the way out of there, though, one of the goons pulls up in one of these diaper vans, whips out a gun, and they put him in the van. And as they get inside, the druggy boys figure out like, oh, Brett Weir has talked. And this is where the movie, because they ran out of ideas, decides to create just a series of comedic set pieces like you would find in a police academy movie. 
to just have them do shit until the film ends. I mean, that's really all this is. Here they're at a meat processing plant. Right. Heavenly Dog Franks is the name of the place. It turns out that they're grinding, I don't know what, the mob's enemies into the hot dogs. Uh Uh-huh. Which doesn't really go anywhere. And I I don't even know if I want to get into it. This is where... They get a phone call. The jerky boys are prank calling him to move the van. And then Kissel is the the voice being used here. They dump a bunch of trash out of the window. They use hot dogs as a rope to get out of the place. None of this is funny. None of it really matters. And they run off and hide in a nightclub. They can't get in at first. And so they find some roadies unloading a van. So they lock the roadies in the van and they get in the club that way they carry in like a big speaker it turns out lo and behold the performer that the roadies were working for is none other than ozzy osbourne who looks entirely confused to be in this movie point of clarification i think ozzy osbourne is playing the manager of the people that are in the nightclub because the name of the band that's performing is is it helmet yeah yeah helmet's a real band i think he's their manager But yeah, he looks totally confused. And this is Ozzy Osbourne pre that MTV show that came out in the, what was that, the early 2000s? Mm -hmm. This felt very Wayne's World-ish. Wayne's World had Alice Cooper show up, so the Jerky Boys gets Ozzy Osbourne. It's a really strange cameo to be in this movie because Ozzy Osbourne is way more famous than Helmet. Why isn't he playing Ozzy Osbourne? We had Tom Jones as Tom Jones. Why not have Ozzy Osbourne as Ozzy Osbourne? Because he's not. not. A fine question. And he asks him like, hey, where are the boys? And they say, oh, yeah, uh, they said that uh, they're going to go on tour with the monkeys. They're in an airplane on their way to Europe right now. The fucking monkeys? Yeah. What? Yeah. And so Tony and his guys start searching the inside of the club after they pull a gun to get in. Which, by the way, anyone who shows up at a club and they're like, yeah, you can't get in, we're full up, and they pull a gun to go inside, they're calling the cops. Here's how you fix this problem. Hey, we got to get inside. Sorry, we're full. He reaches into his suit coat and pulls out $1,000. Right this way, sir. You bribe (laughs) your way in. You don't force your way in with a gun, stupid. That gets the cops called. Right. Anyway, so Helmet goes on. As the goons are closing in on Johnny B and Kamal and they're chased into the bathroom where the goons come in and start kicking in the bathroom stalls, but they don't kick in the last one because Johnny B starts using his gay voice again and like, oh yes, pull it out and slide it in. Yeah, that's, that's it. All right, now jam it right there, right up the ass. So Kamal is joining in. Again, it's one of those things that ages poorly because it's just gay panic humor, right? Yes. So the goons leave, and then outside at the concert, a bunch of amps start exploding. Because the jerky boys wired them up, and they don't know what they're doing. Although, when Ozzy Osbourne is like, are you any good? Yeah. Johnny B says, you kidding me? Are we good? We're the best. We can wire up a toilet seat to suck the ass right out of you. Which, again, is one of those, like, (laughs) non-sequiturs that made me laugh. I'm like, wait a second. First of all, you don't wire up toilet seats. And also, what would the benefit of it sucking the ass out of you be? There's a lot of Johnny B's patter that involves the ass. You know, it'll suck your ass out. We'll shoo you up the ass. You kind of start to question things after a while. So Ozzy ends up calling the Jerky Boys those assholes and uh then they run out on the street Sharon, the dog shitting on the fool <laughs> then there's this whole cab sequence and i don't know how much you want to talk about this i N- none it they, is awful they get in a cab kamal finally gets to do something in the movie they steal a cab because the guy refused to take them where they want to go the jerky boys do but then kamal just drives around the block and they pick up the mobsters it goes nowhere we can skip over it it doesn't do anything they end up at a nightclub that has an egyptian Egyptian theme so mm-hmm. that we can let Kamal do his Egyptian magician bit. And so they scamper into this comedic set piece. And this really goes nowhere. He gets up on stage and they kind of do a magic trick with a, some jewelry from a rich lady from a Marx Brothers movie. The whole thing really goes nowhere. Once the bit falls apart, Kamal escapes upstairs in the building with the hostess of the Egyptian-themed restaurant while Johnny B puts on a black a hat these cartoon glasses that you would buy at a novelty store to make your eyes look great big and an overcoat 
so that he can escape. And the mobsters are like checking everybody. And also that clown that we've mentioned a few times shows up with his knife blades, sort of. That comes up kind of in a little bit but so while johnny b is sneaking out the mobsters are like checking everybody on their way out yeah and kamal's upstairs with this hostess who wants to have sex with him yes but he's not really into her which again doesn't really make sense because the last time we saw him around a girl he started choking looking at her cleavage but here he implies he cannot get an erection so the horny hostess starts playing punji or a flute like a snake charmer uses and we hear the signature Streets of Cairo play, which I guess that's going to make his dick pop up like a snake or something. And that's supposed to be funny. And it's not. Johnny B gets out of the place. And then in the most unbelievable thing that happens in this whole film, Johnny B jumps up and grabs a ladder hanging from a fire escape <laughs> and pulls himself up with the upper body strength of an orangutan. It's crazy. But he climbs up. So he's outside the window while his friend's inside not getting an erection. The mobsters come out and start firing off bullets up into the sky and johnny b's just like come on we gotta go the, the, these goons are behind us so they just run off one of the craziest things about that scene is when the hostess or whatever that has the hots for kamal yeah for no playing, reason whatsoever <laughs> right starts playing her flute as if to like i will coax your penis into an erect status yeah kamal has this look at one point like this is starting to work and he seems oh, really yeah there's a, a brief glimpse of like huh i'll be damned <laughs> this is actually doing something he finds out this is his kink we get another cutaway scene to alan arkin lying on top of the lady and yeah. it's like fruity ass fruity ass Th these boys what? gotta pay i can't be made a fool of these guys are making a fool of me. That's what they're doing. And so back at home, Johnny B and Kamal are like, hey, I guess we got to get out of town, huh? How about we just leave these problems behind us with the geographic solution and get the hell out of here? Yeah. But before they can do that, the detective and a bunch of feds show up and Uncle Freddy, aka William Hickey, is like, I smell trouble. Johnny B is like, look, I got a plan. What we're going to do is we're going to take this recorder and he plugs it up to a phone. And then stop. That's it. Forget about it. And then right, the, right. the feds knock on the door and he's using the Sol Rosenberg voice where he's like, oh my God, please, I'm naked right now. I'm in a bathrobe and all my business is hanging out. Well, boys, sounds like we got the wrong place. Right. All right, everybody, let's go. We're going to just pack it up and go home. Yeah. Until Uncle Freddy is like, don't believe that bullshit thing in there. Yeah. Really? You sure, old man? Yeah. Based on the that evidence, shoot open the door. Yeah. They just blast this thing with their guns to get inside. It went from, well, boys, we're at the wrong place, to like get inside by any means necessary. So sure enough, they do, and find the guys in there wearing the hoods. Right. Why do they have the hoods with the smiley faces on them? And why are they wearing them at this point in the movie? I do not know. This kind of shit in your film like needs to just, just make sense. We're back at the beginning of our movie now where the guys are in their interrogation room this is the story thus far and the feds just laugh and then punch them because they don't believe any of the shit they're saying right they're like we need to talk to frank rizzo and giant b's like i'll give you frank rizzo and then he just does the voice and they're like look we know that that's not true because look here's this police sketch that looks like a third grade drawing yeah that we've got of frank rizzo and also here's this giant folder that's a psychological profile of rizzo it's like a dossier that they've put together in the last 24 to 48 hours and the guys are like the fuck is this and i don't know the feds are like, look, we're going to have you on the, all the crimes that you've been committing from last night, like running from police and illegal right turn. Grand theft auto, statutory rape. They throw that out there because they say that the hostess was underage. The snake charmer was underage. Like that is a sauce I don't need in this movie. Thank you very much, jerky boys. Mm -hmm. Statutory rape. Ugh. So anyway, the goons, Brett Weir and Johnny B's mom are all at their house watching Wheel of Fortune. Clapping their hands along with the game show. Well, sure. No Wheel of Fortune is fun. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, classic. Johnny B calls his mom with his one phone call. He's like, "Ma, I'm in jail," and she's like, "Ah, oh, Johnny, I knew that you'd always end up in jail. You need to get a job. Slap yourself in the head for me. <laughs> Slap Kamal for me too." She just hangs up, and the mobsters over here that our boys are in jail. Then Kamal uses his one phone call to contact a demolition company to send a crew over to just destroy Brett Weir's house. Again, ever the assholes, that's what they're doing from jail. I'm not calling to help our situation. I'm just calling to get even. This was the one joke in the movie that truly made me laugh. Again, all of the laughter that I had up until this point was nostalgic Uh for when I found them funny in their natural state. But he calls up this construction company and this old man answers the phone and he's like, expert construction renovation. And Kamal, again, not in a character voice, he goes like, yeah, I need to talk to somebody about demolition. And this old man goes, yeah, hang on a second. And he puts the phone to his chest and grabs a (laughs) handle Uh of Jim Beam. And just takes a slug. This is like in the middle of the day. A slug off of this, sets it down, goes back on the phone. He's like, demolition, how can I help you? (laughs) Yeah, you're right. That's funny. That's good. Our two mob goons that were at Johnny B's mom's house, they show up and post bail for the jerky boys, which, Bo, you have more legal experience than I do. Can just a random stranger bail you out of jail? I think so. I don't. I think it doesn't matter, right? If somebody's willing to pay the bill, you're fine. In this case, okay, hey, go bail them out of jail and murder them. I think you could do that. If you're like, no, 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 no. I want to stay here. No, 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 no. <laughs> I haven't tried it personally, but now that I know it's an option. It seems like a pretty good loophole. Honestly, this is the best, like, most dangerous game scenario where you find some people that you can bail out of jail that are in trouble and then take them to your island and hunt them for sport. There you go. So, you know, like, use it to your advantage. Like, who's going to care? Get some people sure. who were uh, arrested for vagrancy or loitering or something that it just won't be missed. I don't mean to give our listeners any ideas, but... Johnny V says to the mobster, he's like, you know, Frank Rizzo, he's not going to be too happy when he hears that his top two boys uh, got killed by Alan Arkin. They bail him out of jail and they take him over to Baby Cake's diaper service. And once they get inside, they find that Johnny B's mom is there and both of her feet are stuck into empty laundry detergent, <laughs> like cardboard boxes, but they're now filled with cement. And we see two more pairs of empty boxes that are clearly going to be filled with the feet of... Of the jerky boys that's right alan arkin shows up and he says who's the fruity ass now hmm? what does that mean fruity ass when you say fruity ass what are you talking about like my ass smells like fruit does it look like fruit what kind of fruit like 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 a like a, a tangerine or grapes is it lumpy if you're talking about that time i was at that party and i sat on the tray of strawberries and my ass smelled like strawberries for a week look is that what is that what you mean because honestly my ass never smelled better I wish my ass smelled like strawberries all the time. I was talking to Georgia Fox upstairs. She was like, hey, I wish you still smelled like strawberries and your balls smelled like grapes instead of looking like old old raisins. You say fruity ass like it's it's an insult. I would love it if my ass smelled like fruit all the time. I wish that. Maybe you know, a cantaloupe? What about a cantaloupe? Is it kind of a crisp, fresh smell? Like a summer fruit? Could be a summer <laughs> fruity ass? Or are we talking more of a fall fruity ass? The yeah, fall fruity ass is more, that's more strawberry, maybe a little pumpkin. A pumpkin spice ass. Now we're going to something. Hang on, I gotta call my buddy Jack Lemon. Jack, how about a pumpkin spice ass? Real quick, you boys, do you know anything about this new craze in women's fashion where it says juicy across the ass? Is that what you're talking about, fruity ass? Something like that? I mean, what is that juicy? If I squeeze the ass, are my hands gonna get wet? You know who's got a real juicy ass? Georgia Fox. She's not famous yet, but she's gonna be. You wanna see her? She's upstairs right now. Yeah, they could run a, a CSI scan on that ass. Hey, i never seen that show, jerky. Alan Arkin says to him, uh, so anyway, enough of this uh, fruit ass talk. Uh, you got any last uh, words before we uh, we kill you? And Johnny B kind of jumps in. He's like, yeah, Frank Rizzo ain't going to be happy if he you kill two of his boys. And by the way, Brett Weir over there, he used to work for Frank Rizzo. Which I was like, that's some pretty good thinking. He got run out of Chicago for skimming. He's just telling you what you want to hear. Alan Arkin's like, really? Well, it's just strange that Frank Rizzo's not around when I got you boys here. And they're like, yeah, how about you give him a call there, fruity ass? Hey, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Everybody, you want to go upstairs in my office? We'll call Frank Rizzo. I'll order up a fruit plate. 
all this talk about fruits made me a little bit hungry. I'll tell you what, we'll get some crackers, maybe some cheese, and then some fruit. Nice charcuterie plate. We'll get some wine from downstairs. We'll call Frank Rizzo. We'll sort this whole thing out. Also, let's pause and just take note of the fact that it's fun to say charcuterie. Everybody on board with that? It's just a fun word to say. It's like onomatopoeia, charcuterie. All right, uh, let's go make this phone call, everybody. So they go up to his office, and Alan Arkin calls Frank Rizzo. You're like, "Uh uh-oh, the boys are in a pinch because there's no way that Frank Rizzo can answer the phone because Johnny B is sitting there in the office and is unable to perform this voice. But Bo, Mm -hmm. somehow the phone answers. Keyword being somehow. (laughs) Yeah. And it's Frank Rizzo. Who the fuck is this? And Alan Arkin has this conversation with Frank Rizzo. It is a real like, (coughs) sorry, I can't come to the door right now. I'm very sick. Yeah, but Alan Arkin asks a series of questions that Frank Rizzo responds to. And here's what's going on. That Johnny B has pre-recorded a tape. Uh huh. To fill in the blanks of this conversation, the implausibility of this is immeasurable. Yeah, off the charts. Hey, is this Frank Rizzo? Yeah, you know it's me, Frank Rizzo. Uh, Frank Rizzo, what's your birthday combined with the number 28? 52 there, jackass. August 16th, 1967, plus the number 28, jackass. And it's, his questions are too specific for him to have provided this type of spaced out dialogue. Also, it, it like it goes over up until th- they hang up and Brett Weir is like, hey, I'm going to make this bold move and leap for the phone before they kill me just to call them back. And I guess the the reason is, is that it saves Brett Weir's life or whatever. But also, why not just have the initial call like with Alan Arkin where he's like, all right, Frank Rizzo, I'm done talking to you and then have the tape begin again or something as opposed to going through this unnecessary step of them hanging up and then calling back to determine that the tape is a lie here's how you fix the whole fucking thing let's go upstairs have them call and the boys are like they're trying to figure out anything okay they're like we are going to die they go upstairs they're like all right what's his number he gives them a number you know 555-888-5555 the phone rings and you hear a voice go like hello and he's like is this frank rizzo and the guy's like yeah this is frank rizzo what does it matter and they have the conversation they hang up and then they're like like how can this be here's what's going on they let the boys go and then we cut and it's uncle freddy it's mm-hmm. the old man who loved their shtick and he can kind of do the voice too a little bit mm-hmm. so it's like holy shit just just call him and and that might help johnny b's only got two people that he knows in this all well, three including kamal his mom and the old man next door that's it and then they're like oh because he likes them he gets them out of it because it's a real deus ex hickey at the end of this movie that is also yeah. unnecessary while they're on the phone the boys get free they take off they get his mom yeah Yeah. she kicks a guy in the balls with her cement shoes did we mention that brett weir redials the number and we hear the (coughs) hello i'm sorry i can't answer like it's a tape recording right and so that's where they're like we gotta get those guys they tricked us and our heroes and their mom are on the run back to her house because why would they go look for them there Bo? so they steal a diaper van get Mm -hmm. home where they have Alan Arkin recorded about the whole operation, because that's the thing, is that Alan Arkin, when he's on the phone with Rizzo, is like, listen, I got everybody in my pocket. I got the criminal empire, and I'm paying off the cops to take care of that, and if the cops get out of line, then I got my criminal empire to take care of the cops. And so they call the detective, and they're like, Hey there, jerky, we got the goods on this Alan Arkin character. So there is reason why they go to the house to get the tape with the evidence. So Right. And so Criticism rescinded Jerky Boys of the movie. (laughs) Well done. Tip of the the chapeau (laughs) to Jerky Boys the movie. But so the feds show up at the same time as all these goons do, and the the boys are like, Oh boy, there's about to be a real shootout out there. They're gonna be jagging each other up in the ass with all these bullets in a minute. <laughs> and then we see Alan Arkin and our detective meet up in the middle of the street and hug. So the cops and the mob are in cahoots, which was a nice little twist. I did not see that coming. Absolutely. If it paid off in any way that mattered, it would be great. Did you recognize when the movie said goodbye to Johnny B's mom and she's like, you boys stay out of trouble and get a job. Slap, slap. And then she says, I'm going to head over to May Parker's for the rest of the movie. And she leaves. And I was like, why would you mention May Parker in Brooklyn? 
as the ant of Spider-Man in this film. A tip of the chapeau. Technically, a lot of people don't realize this, is that Jerky Boys is the beginning of the MCU. Is it? That would make sense. <laughs> Could you argue that, that this is part of the Marvel? Absolutely. <laughs> if if Ma is going over to hang out with May Parker. That counts. Yeah. I mean, and then the question is, the sexy ant or the old ant? Oh, old ant. Oh. She's an old woman. And she's got her feet stuck in boxes of gain with cement. <laughs> I love gain. When you are washing clothes with gain, what that means is, I am on a budget. <laughs> and there is no shame in that. Gain, better than washing with water, <laughs> but only slightly. <laughs> gain, better than your own saliva. <laughs> I open up the washing machine, I spit in there a couple of times jerky, I dip my ass in the water, and then I turn it on. <laughs> you gotta fit so, the ass in everywhere. <laughs> the jerky boys see the cops hugging outside, and they're like, oh, jeez, we're in big trouble now. So then, they escape. The whole reason they're able to get away is that Alan Arkin is, is on his way in the house, and he looks over and sees Uncle Freddy there. Yeah, William Hickey, the living skeleton. Yeah, and has this whole flashback when he was a young man in Italy or whatever, where he remembers being a little boy on the side of the street as Don Frederico, a.k.a. Uncle Freddy, is AKA taken by... A.k.a. William Hickey. A.k.a. William Hickey, is taken by in this, like, parade of crime or something that is happening uh -huh. in this town. And he's like, oh my god, you're Don Frederico. You're one of the biggest inspirations in my criminal life. And he bends down to kiss Uncle Freddy's ring, a.k.a. William Hickey, and burns his head on the cigar that William Hickey is holding. Mm -hmm. And so while this is going on and everyone seems to be distracted, the jerky boys grab a diaper van and now there's just a big car chase, yeah. which is completely unnecessary in a jerky boys movie because it only lasts for about two seconds where yeah. they abandon the van to get on an elevated train and go to Times Square where we get the camera sweeping around them as they are calling a bunch of newspapers to say, hey there jerky, we got the story of the century here. Clean out your ears, jackasses. Think about using two payphones in Times Square like this. Just the level of disease and just semen and HIV in the 90s that was all over them. I mean, it had to just be like, no. Remember how you used to use payphones? Like you would pinch it with two fingers and then hold it away from your face. I mean, Steve Martin did this in Plain Strains and I was, that's how you used a payphone. Yeah. Like there was no sure. like putting it on your ear and cradling it to your shoulder. That was, uh, gr no. Your ear would fall off if you did that three days later. You would have to be quarantined like the outbreak monkey just to make sure that you didn't pass something along to loved ones. So they call up all of the local media and say we got the goods on the thing and then the movie just wraps itself up it's just a bunch of spinning papers about how the reclusive frank rizzo has revealed this major crime yep. and that audio has been released and brett weir has turned state's evidence also a one about sparky the clown from the magic show being held for a bizarre crime they talk about the hot dogs being made of soylent green and people yeah that comes out and then there's a news reporter who's like, hey, if you weren't paying attention, here's what happened at the end of this movie. Also, when we spoke with Frank Rizzo, he said that Johnny B and Kamal were essential in the foiling of the crime. And, and I quote, they did a beautiful job for me. Beautiful job. You got me, jerky. And then we cut to Johnny B and Kamal, and they now have cushy jobs working for the city. Uh-huh. Although on their desk are two taxidermied stuffed piranha. Which was a little strange. <laughs> yeah. And they're they're just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. And there's like, so uh, what are two lowlife douchebags working for the city like us do when we're bored? Hey, I got an idea. And then they make a prank phone call where the movie shows us stock footage of then President Bill Clinton in the White House. And it's real fuzzy. It's cheap footage. And then we get this barely passable Bill Clinton impersonator having a back and forth with Frank Rizzo. Yeah. Yeah, it's real bad. Hey, Al, uh, who's that you, man? Hey, you call him me, Bubba. Hey, you're like, what? Again, big problem with, hey, none of this is real. It made more evident by the fact that this is a bad Bill Clinton impression. 
There is a mid credit scene, if you stick around for it, where Brett Weir walks out of his house and an excavator shows up and starts to demolish it. So that happens. <laughs> that That is the thing that happens in this movie. I mean, at the very least, didn't you expect them to play real prank phone calls over the credits? Yeah. Yeah. Like, give me a little taste of why I came to this movie in the first place, because it's not because I think Johnny B and Kamal are great actors. It's because I want to hear them do jerky boy shit and yeah. doing it with scripted calls doesn't do anything for me this is the biggest problem with the movie it misunderstands why an audience would come to this movie in the first place yeah but that's it that's the end of the movie that's all you got for a jerky boys movie and it's a thin it ain't plot. much yeah it's a super thin plot the comedy stuff only works in the sense that hearing a grown man say things like yeah i'm gonna shoot him up the ass with some boiled potatoes that's kind of funny but that's it. What made the Jerky Boys so good is the person on the other end of the phone trying to figure out what kind of maniac had called them on the phone. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Jerky Boys call? Like for those people who've never heard the Jerky Boys that are listening to this and want to go find one, do you have one you would recommend? I think the Frank Rizzo calling about the job as a mechanic. I thought you were going to say Frank Rizzo calling about selling cars that's a good one the mechanic one i like because it's what he's like yeah i got a bench uh, i'm benching like 350 oh you have 350 pieces <laughs> pieces what the fuck pounds baby pounds my go-to <laughs> it may not be the funniest is the piano tuner that's quite good and him calling up and asking this guy about tuning a piano and then the call it turns <laughs> out that he has a rottweiler that got stuck in the piano and he needs a piano tuner to get this dog out and he's like this dog is too much for me <laughs> Like, I was like, you have a dog in your piano? He's like, yeah, he's caught in the wires and shit. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> it's the, the natural human reaction. Because, <laughs> like, here's here's the thing. Here's what makes the Jerky Boys kind of genius, at least within the context of the time it was released, is that if you've ever worked customer service <laughs> at any level, you know there are some crazy motherfuckers out there. <laughs> right. Hearing somebody trying to, especially the job applications, the customer service, the calling for service for the piano, whatever it is, you can hear them struggling, the the actual human beings that they're calling struggling with is is this for real probably it is because people can be this crazy yeah and how do i get out of this there's something that they did around their second or third album where they flipped the script and started having inbound calls yeah yeah, yeah. And there's one in particular where they placed an ad to help people get on game shows like Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune. And there's one in particular where the guy's like coaching this person through what it's going to be like to be on Jeopardy with Alex Trebek. And it is just riddled with nonsense it gets to the point where he's talking about if you don't answer the question in this appropriate way alex trebek will come over and slap you in the mouth and like <laughs> these people are just like <laughs> thinking that they're talking to someone normal and it, it clearly isn't all of the frank rizzo stuff in particular i i think like that was always the highlights of any of the jerky boy stuff the saul rosenberg like the one where the first one i think it is the the one with the you know i'll bring all my glasses in my shoes so i'll have them that kind of stuff is pretty funny but the frank rizzo is the high water mark of any of the jerky boys records especially that stuff where, where frank rizzo is just calling and it's the undeserved confidence that yeah. that he has. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean that stuff is pretty funny, and and I still think some of those calls are genuinely funny. Like even laughing about it now, the the whole you know pieces. What the fuck? Pounds, baby, pounds. Like that <laughs> still makes me laugh. Of that basic misunderstanding of I'm talking about how much I bench, and you're asking how many pieces I have in my toolbox. I think the one where he calls to get the job selling cars, <laughs> and it's not even overconfidence it's something beyond that of like where he like calls up and it's not that he's asking for the job he's already given himself the job he's telling him what days he's going to be coming into work and the guy's like whoa 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 guy i gotta hire you first it's like, and it's just like look i'm gonna be there on uh, what day do you want me tuesday or wednesday it's like you could come tuesday yeah tuesday's no good for me it was something in their own way they still are very very funny uh despite some of the stuff like i said the the gay voice and all of that it clearly doesn't age well at all but a 
lot of their other stuff that was just throwing people into these wild situations was very funny. And like nothing anybody had really heard on such a large scale. I mean, the fact that they were picked up by such national personalities like Howard Stern or other venues to get to the point where it's like, hey, we can make money off this. We can sell CDs and, and records of this and turn a buck was crazy. Just having those tapes and, and records kind of passed around with friends and laughing about it. I mean, it became this weird kind of shorthand. Yeah. And and the pop culture aspect of it is hard to overstate. Like it, it was kind of everywhere with people you knew, especially people who enjoyed comedy. Like all of us were kind of in on the same joke. Seth MacFarlane went to Johnny B and he got the job on Family Guy as Mort because, I mean, Seth MacFarlane was like, this was one of the funniest things I'd ever heard ever. Yeah. Not just then, in all of comedy, this is truly one of the funniest things ever. So to come in and not only do a voice, but be a writer and a contributor to one of the most iconic animated series of all time is huge. The Jerky Boys movie totally crappy <laughs> not worth your time at all uh, no. some of that old jerky boy stuff like some of it ages poorly but some of it is still very funny and it's been kind of fun to go back and remember how good some of it was and how funny some of it was yeah. uh anything that i laughed at in the movie was mostly remembering the original calls and it, it's yeah. been a good time to sort of revisit those and get some genuine laughs out of it so similar to the garbage pail kids movie i I think showing this film to someone who doesn't know anything about the Jerky Boys, you would just be lost. Yeah. It is just nonsensical stupidity. Not in a good way. But if you just gave someone, give them a YouTube playlist of some of the best Jerky oh. Boys calls, and they're probably still going to be very funny. Absolutely. Speaking of, of things that age poorly, Chad. You know, Bo. Yes. You know, I'm really into healthy living. Oh. Um, you know, like mental health that's important to me yeah. and uh, physical health yeah, yeah, yeah you know i'm always talking about uh eating a healthy diet mm -hmm. and getting enough exercise and then i don't really do anything about either of those things yeah yeah, yeah. well but i thought that maybe if we were to dive into the pop culture phenomena of aerobic exercise in the 1980s mm -hmm. woven into a dramatic romantic forgotten cinema classic it might help me out and i found the perfect movie in a movie titled perfect starring now oscar winning actress jamie lee curtis and two-time oscar nominated actor john travolta yeah which i think it is a debut for both of them on this podcast travolta's not been here before has he oh i'm trying to think i don't i don't know i mean we've been doing this so long now god only knows but i don't think he's don't think been he on has. the podcast Podcast, we have threatened to do one of those look who's talking movies uh-huh yeah. and we've really danced around the idea of like face off finding a, a season for that gem or broken arrow or phenomenon phenomena is a good one staying alive the sequel to saturday night fever as directed by sylvester stallone that's one i would love to do yeah but um i think this may be his debut appearance so we are thrilled to have him join us along with jamie lee curtis and there's going to be a lot of leotards and leg warmers, a lot of gyrating. I'm sure there's going to be some wonderful sexual tension. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> between me and Jamie Lee Curtis, if nothing else. I mean, it'll be very one-sided. But Sure, sure. I've never seen this movie. I barely remembered that it was a thing until you mentioned it to me. Right. But I can't wait to do a bad John Travolta impression. I think that will be a wonderful time. I think most John Travolta impressions are bad. Yeah, you got this one covered. This won't surprise anyone then. So come see us in two weeks time. We will be discussing the movie Perfect and all things aerobic and exercise related. As always, like, rate, review, tell a friend about the show. You can send us an email at picksixmovies at gmail.com. You can find us on uh, Facebook and Instagram. We are no longer on Twitter because Pick Six Movies voted and we took a stance and said Twitter no more because we weren't really using Twitter at all in general. So uh, that kind of got the heat up. So anyway, track us down, say hello, drop us a line. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on the Jerky Boys movie? Hey there, jerkies. The show is over. Get your hands out of your pants, rubberneck. Oh, oh, it's very frightening with the words. Oh, I'll bring all my ear pods and my podcasts so I'll have them. <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks time, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>